Uh, just uh, during the early 70s, you were classed as a Europhile and a supporter of the uh, EEC, which was against the Labour Party policy and the whips. Uh, I was wondering what your reasons for this was. Well, I always believe, and I still believe, that the best way to produce prosperity in Britain, increasing gross domestic product, growth, investment, was to be part of the European Union. And that to not be part when the European Union expanded after the original treaty, after the Treaty of Rome, would have, in my view, been disastrous and was disastrous two years. Um, I've always believed too in a political community, not because of the rather foolish Shirley Williams people that it stops us going to war, I don't think it would stop us going to war and I don't think we'd go to war even if it wasn't the European Union, but because political harmonisation and economic harmonisation seem to me to go hand in hand, which is exactly what is happening. Uh, we're not having a conscious drift or drive towards a political union, but it's coming about because you can't have economic union without having some political regulation, the two things are happening. And I've no doubt at all we're much more prosperous inside and that we would now be absolutely disastrous, not were we to leave, which no rational person thinks of, but were we to take our position firmly in the second tier of Europe, in the slow lane. We're edging towards that, but I think that would be a great disaster. Even though like some of the critics at the time said that uh, the EC was pro-capitalist and against the working class, what was like, what's going, do you agree with that kind of statement or is, is it because you think Britain would have been better off? Of course off? I don't agree with it, that was Tony Benn. I don't agree with Tony Benn. Um, there's no doubt at all that in a sense uh, it enshrines some of the principles of the capitalist economy. It is a competitive operation. Mm. Um, but it's not as competitive as it needs, that Britain has made it. I mean, Britain has chosen over the last eight years, partly the last years of the Labour government, certainly the two years of the coalition, to regard competition as both the best way of achieving efficiency and the best way of, of distributing resources. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. In manufacturing industry it probably is, in distribution industry it probably is, in things like social services, the health service, education, it isn't. And where I don't want the market to operate, it doesn't have to operate in the union. It's our choice that we've extended it in the way we have. Um, um, you were Secretary of State for Crisis and Consumer Protection between 76 and 79. Um, what did this post entail and why was it so important? Well, it was half, of the, half the Board of Trade. Um, in those new ministries always invent fancy names for things. Um, and Jim Collins, before me, Shirley Williams, my predecessor, split up the Board of Trade into what amounted to Department of Overseas Trade, which was Edmund Dell, and then John Smith, and internal trade matters, which was me, Shirley Williams, and then me. And spatched up onto that was the price of policy and the income policy. I suppose the thing which I did with most enthusiasm the problem with least success was chairing the cabinet wages committee, earnings committee, um, and trying to do something about regulating pay. I mean, we believed in the classic, actually, labour way. The tree you'll see in 1910 was saying this. Sometimes workers have to forego wage increases to guarantee employment for other workers. And we were trying to balance out the two things. So the important job, which towards the end was of taking, I suppose, a seven day week, four days of a seven day week, was trying to get pay policy right, income policy right, negotiating the three agreements we got with the TUC, failing to negotiate the fourth, whilst it had all the old Board of Trade stuff, regulation, Monopolist Commission, pro, uh, Fair Trading Commission, it basically, in the end, was trying to regulate pay and try to regulate prices. Thank you. Right. Um, you were a key advocate of um, Jim Callaghan when he was in government. Um, do you do you believe that it was due to his personal failings that the Labour Party collapsed in 1979, or was it um, external factors like the rise of Margaret Thatcher? I think the Labour Party had run out of time in '79. Yeah, um, run out of ideas. Um, it was a very young cabinet actually. There were the, the the day we lost the election, six of us came out of cabinet from number 10 together, all of us under 45, and all of us saying to each other, don't worry, we'll be back in five years, or don't worry, we'll be back in 10, not five. <laughs> um, 
But not that notwithstanding, uh, we were inclined to be what Terry Clausen once said about another government, in favour of what we used to do, and perhaps a bit more and a bit better. We weren't looking for new ideas. Yeah. But also, the spirit abroad was that collectivism, uh, the common good, was not the way to prosperity. The tiger economies of Southeast Asia, rugged individualism, and people believed that before Mrs. Thatcher said it. But Mrs. Thatcher managed wonderfully well to articulate this theory that all this collective stuff uh, is nonsense. And the trade unions during the winter of discontent mm -hmm. undermined that view, uh, undermined our view of collective responsibility, right. of corporate responsibility. Um, and our attempt to regulate the economy seemed to have failed and therefore confirmed the idea that every man or every woman for himself is the best way of going on. So the ideas are wrong. As a matter of detail, Jim could have postponed the election from February till the following October. Right. Um, it's in a book somewhere that I wrote. Um, of all people, Enoch Powell agreed to bring the entire ultra-unionist parliamentary party behind the government if we would form, if we organise a pipeline between the mainland and Northern Ireland. John Smith and I and Anne Taylor, who was a worker in my department, negotiated with Powell and I mean he was ready on the day of the vote of no confidence to deliver his troops. But Jim Cullen wouldn't do it on the basis that he hadn't gone through a parliamentary committee he wasn't just going to sell the government's policy to the Pagnot Powell votes. In fact, I now think that he wouldn't do it because he didn't believe we'd win the subsequent general election by enough votes and didn't want to drag on putting parcels together all the time, getting alliances. He got tired of doing all that. Mm -hmm. But I don't blame Jim. Um, John Smith and I were furious at the time, but uh, the real thing was the Labour Party had run out of steam, run out of ideas. Right. Okay. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.